Hello, we want to thank you for joining us again for our midweek Bible study at True Life Church. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the lessons that Brian and student pastor David have been teaching uh, for the book of James. I'd like to just talk to us just for a moment about this Bible study. Um, the, James writes, if you remember from my first lesson, the introduction that we did three weeks ago, James is writing to the church in Jerusalem, a church that uh, was made up of Jews, like we had discussed, that has believed now that Jesus is the Messiah, that he, um, he was crucified, the death, burial, and resurrection, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, and hope of glory. They believe these things, and because of it, they are being persecuted, and they're living in fear. Um, they're believing in the new dispensation of grace, and um, those that still uh, believe in the dispensation totally of the law, uh, they're being persecuted by them. So they find themselves, this church, this letter that James is writing, the people that he's writing to, find themselves uh, holding up in their homes in fear. They find themselves, some of them left their homes, left their hometowns, left their friends and family. They have dispersed to different cities, to different kingdoms. They're having to learn new languages, new verbiage, new words. They're having to learn new economies, new ways of trading. They're having to learn uh, new social uh, norms. That Everything that was normal to them is now disrupted. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Does any of it sound familiar? I don't believe it was a coincidence that our pastoral staff, uh, probably a month before uh, the word COVID-19 or social distancing or um, shelter in place, before those terms were normal vernacular within our homes, our pastoral staff felt the burden to put this Bible study into play for our adult class. So, and I don't think that's a coincidence. The similarities between what is going on in the church when James writes this letter and what is going on with the church today are very similar. They are very similar. And I, I believe that if we will open our hearts to this study, that God can continue to do the work that he chooses to do in each and every one of us. So I thank you for joining us. If you will pray with me just real quick uh, for this study. Um, Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity for your word to dive into it, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to come to your people online. I pray that you would edify and speak the words that we would have for your people. Speak to us, Lord, into our hearts. Give us words to hear, I pray. In Jesus, or give us ears to hear, I pray in Jesus' name that we can hear your word. I pray these things in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. Thank you so much for praying with me. James uh, made a few points in chapter one that David and Brian covered for us. And part of that was he just wanted to set the church, this church that is living in fear, he wants to set their heart at rest. He wants to encourage them. He wants to let them know a few things. One, temptations, the temptations you're facing, those don't come from God. They cannot come from God. So don't believe that lie. He lets them know uh, that the trial that you're in, the trial that you're in, you are not alone. Please hear that. You are not alone during the scary time of your life. God is with you. He is doing a work. He will do a work in you, redeem you through this trial to be better. That's the way he works. There's so many examples in the scripture. Uh, Joseph, for one, he goes through a child and God redeems him into a better place and into a better faith and strength in him. Uh, Brian taught on that two weeks ago, and God wants us to understand that. During your trial, you are not alone. You are not alone. He is with you, and he will use it for your good if you are open to that. Uh, James also encourages the church. Uh, student pastor David talked on it. Please be a hearer. While there are so many distractions going on, while you're living in fear, while you're learning a new culture, while you're home all the time, while you can't see your friends and you miss your home town, while these things are happening, when you can't assemble in the church at Jerusalem, but you are having church in your home, while you are doing that, please do not be distracted, but be a hearer of the word of God. His voice is reaching out to you. He's calling to you through his word. He's calling to you through your prayer. He's calling to you through circumstances around you. He's calling to you even through the people in your home. Hey, please remember that he is calling to you. Those are the things that James is trying to establish. You see, the church, when they left, when they fled Jerusalem and they were dispersed, they took three things with them. Three things. They took their faith with them, their conversion experience. They took their understanding. You see, these people believed 
like we established, he believed in Jesus and who he was and the name and the power that came with that. They took that conversion experience. They took their families with them, those in their household, and they took that ever-present flesh that we are with them as well. Does that sound familiar? Many of us find ourselves in that place today. We have our faith, our understanding of God. We have those that we have been shut in in our homes with. And we do have that flesh that we are walking in. We do have those three things, just like that church in the book of James did, with them in this new and strange land. We must be open, James is saying, we must be open during this strange time. Please remove all doubt and fear, but also be open and hear the word of God. Uh, Alan Redpath, uh, a quote from him that I really love, says, The conversion of a soul is the miracle of a moment. But the manufacturing of a saint is the task of a lifetime. We have had ample opportunities with our families to look in the mirror, to look in the mirror in our home and see ourselves. Stress will allow different factions of our flesh to rise up. It is a perfect condition, a perfect boiling point in our lives. Stress is to see those things in our flesh that will rise up. Be willing to look in the mirror. Our spouses are a wonderful mirror for ourselves to see ourselves clearly. Our children, those in our home that we've been locked in with, those are perfect mirror opportunities for us to see those things that may be rising up. Another quote I wanted to bring you, uh, King David actually uh, wrote it in Psalms 139. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I can tell you over the past couple weeks, uh, Team Ball, that's what we call our family, has had ample opportunities to look in the mirror of each other to see ourselves as we are uh, our children, our adult children. They have been in college away, living on campus for years. We have doubled the size of people in our home once again, and we are all together uh, keeping safe. There have been times when that mirror has just shot up, and I'll tell you what, there is nothing more humbling than when your flesh is getting a little bit out of sorts, and you look at your child whom you have taught, and they have that look in their eye, and you know that in them they're thinking, um, you know and I know what the Bible says about that. Mm -hmm. Or I, there have been a few times in life where my children have looked at me and uh, or their father <laughs> sometimes and they've been like, mm, I know you taught me different than that from the Word of God. Oh, thou hypocrite. And we have a laugh. We get a little indignant, maybe. But those are aha moments. Those are willingly looking in the mirror moments. Please allow that time uh, I encourage you while you are home with your family and throughout the rest of your life, allow those mere moments to be received. Be teachable. Have a teachable spirit as David did. Show me my heart. Make my thoughts known, oh God. Help me to be more like you because I don't want that disconnect from my faith, my conversion experience to be disconnected from the works, your your gospel being alive in me and working through me. So please be open to that. Let your home be a safe place. Let your home be a safe place to sit down at the table and have those conversations with your family. Um, sometimes we have feelings or understandings that aren't necessarily based on biblical facts, but we need a safe place to voice those and then a place to be educated on an equal and open plane. So I encourage you to do that with your family as you're going through this, but James is reminding them, be teachable, be teachable. Remember the grace that has saved you. Do not take comfort in the distractions of the new norm for you. Yep. James asked them very pointedly through his words. He is asking them, are you a Christian? Well, that seems like a strange question. Am I? Of course I'm a Christian. I'm willing to leave my home to be persecuted. I'm in fear for my life in some places. Of course I'm a Christian. But he's saying, are you a Christian? Is your faith alive in you? Because if it is alive in you, if so, then it works. And the works that you do will align with your faith. They will align with your faith. The work that we allow God to do in us and the works that we do 
as a result of the grace that we have received. They will align. And he asks them very pointedly in these next lessons. He points out some, some things that he's saying, hey, your fruits. Church, I love you. I love you as God loves you. James was a founder, a founding father, spiritual father in the church in Jerusalem. And he is coming to them as their pastor. He is coming to them in a love as a father comes to his child and says, I love you. And so I need to bring this mirror up to you a little bit. I need to point these things out, these fruits that are not of the God, the gospel that you have received. You've been distracted. There's some different things in your life going on, but you must hold true. You must hold true to the things that Jesus taught us, to his word, that we can become what he has called us to be and fulfill the purpose of this disbursement. Let us remember when those times come, the encouraging words of Hebrew 12, Hebrews 12, and it says, Do not forget this word of encouragement, that God addresses you as a father addresses his son. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one that he loves, and he chastens everyone that he accepts as his son. When those mere moments come up, when the Lord is speaking to you through the, the sermons you're watching online, through your Bible reading, which is so vitally important and the best way to hear from the Lord, through your time in prayer, when he does that, be encouraged. Matthew says, don't forget the encouraging words of the Lord, that he chastens those that he accepts as his son. They are his heirs to the kingdom. They are sons and daughters of a heavenly father. They are princes and princess of the almighty king. He accepts you as his heir, and he disciplines you because he loves you. Let us be as David and say, search me, O oh God. I won't lie to you, church family. When I was asked to teach this lesson and read through it, there is a shifting in James' letter, and he gets very pointed. He becomes very pastoral to the church, and I thought, who in the world am I, uh, just a saint of true life, to be teaching these things? But I do feel a call of teaching on my life, I have tried to accept it, and the Lord, through prayer, told me, he said, you are called to teach. You do not choose who you teach. I do. And so these words were confirmed to me. They are pointed to me as well to all of us that will have ears to hear. We just bring what the Lord lays on our heart, and I thank God for the confirmation that I have heard through other lessons, through other sermons, uh, I was very leery. I had had some notes that weren't necessarily in the Bible study, but in the same vein. And I am very thankful for the confirmation of three witnesses, different points over the past 48 hours that God has given me uh, for this lesson. So that encourages me when I get convicted. It encourages me because it shows me God does love me. And it shows me that he does want me to progress and to become better and enter into peace and enter into my calling. So I encourage you to feel the same when he calls, when he chastens, when he disciplines. It is out of love because you are an heir to the king. Do not forget that. And remember, in the warning, in the warning from the Lord, there is always, always an invitation to something better. There's always something better to be given. He sees from the beginning to the end. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what's going on all around the world, and he knows what tomorrow brings. So be confident that he continues the good work in you, and be confident that he knows and sees you, and sees what is best for you, what will harm you, what will bring you strife, and where your peace that passes understanding lies. And be willing to look as James draws us through different points in the mirror, and to be willing to allow our faith to be alive in us. Be a teachable hearer of the word. James chapter 1, verse 26 and verse 27, the last two verses of chapter 1 says this, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, in Matthew 
Jesus is asked by an attorney or a lawyer, he's asked, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replies, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is like unto the first, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus doesn't even skip a beat with those two scriptures. What's the greatest commandment? Obviously, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And if you love the Lord, it will bring forth fruits. If your faith, your conversion experience of loving God and knowing who he is, the church James writes to the church that has been dispersed because of their belief in Jesus, if you love him, you will love your neighbor as yourself. Other people will be just as important to you as your own self. You will understand that love. You cannot separate them. More faith, if it is alive, will produce works of loving others and cherishing others. That is what Jesus is telling them. Now, James is writing to this church, his people, and he's saying, it is possible, it is possible, and from some of your fruits, it is probable that you are not concerned with these two commandments. You were on the Sermon on the Mount. You heard the words of Jesus, just as I have. We have taught them to you. That is part of your conversion and is part of your understanding and your faith in Christ Jesus. And yet some of us are okay with staying there and not applying, not applying that second commandment or not allowing God to continue the work in us. Just my conversion is enough. Remember, that is just the miraculous beginning, that moment of your life. But God desires the progress throughout our lives to become more like Him. It's possible to say, well, I am a faithful church attender. I sing on the platform. I work in the sound booth. I play a musical instrument. I'm a teacher. I'm a preacher. I go to church all the time. I'm always there when the doors are open. None of that's happening right now, is it? Very few of us are going to the church, and they're only doing just a couple of them to produce the live services. So if I'm defining my faith, my Christianity, the fruits of my Christianity are that I go to church, that I participate, that I minister in these different things, and that's it. And I ask myself, Lord, is my faith more than that? We've heard a lot of that. The church is not the building. That's not what the church is about. James is asking them, are you a Christian? Is your faith alive in you? Are you having some works? He warns them that if we do not willingly honor God with our lives, that we can deceive ourselves. We can be deceived. Uh, our relationship with him must continue to grow. This was true before COVID-19, and it is so amply, blatantly in our face now. Preachers have preached for years. It is more than what you do in the house of God that makes you a Christian. And yet now we are forced not to be in the house of God. And I must ask myself, how do I continue to grow in you, Lord? How do I continue past just what I feel at the altars of the church? How do I bring that walk with you into the four walls of my home even more than before? Thank you for the services. Praise team, thank you. We feel the Holy Ghost. We weep and we worship as we see them. But it's taken time and it's odd. It's different. It is a little um, very personal. It's, it's a lot more personal when your people, you're not in a group, but you're just with your immediate family right there in your room. It can be different, but we can do it. And James is saying, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived that because you have knowledge of who he is, that you are an actively working uh, Christian that your faith is alive for Matthew 7 21 even says not everyone who says to me this is Jesus speaking not everyone who says to me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who the ones who do my work the will of the father who is in heaven those are the ones he goes on to say some of you even will cast out devils and do miracles in my names in my name and then I will say I do not know you because we do not have an intimate relationship with you these things are beautiful. Remember, James loves this church. God speaks to us as a father to a son. He loves us. It is this time we have been given, if we allow ourselves to have the right perspective that Pastor Chris was talking about last Sunday, uh, two Sundays ago, if we have the right perspective, if we allow God to do the work in us that he desires, it is these times that we can grow and become more personal personal, uh, personable with Jesus, more intimate with him. We must be open. We must be teachable. 
hearers of the word. There is an author and former pastor, Tim Keller. He's the author of the book, Gospel in Life. Our author of our Bible study actually mentions this quote, and it really spoke to me, so I wanted to bring it to you. Um, Tim Keller says, A merely religious person who believes God will favor him because of his morality and respectability will ordinarily have contempt for the outcasts saying to himself, I worked hard to get where I am, and so can anyone else. This is the language of a moralist's heart. In contrast, the language of a Christian heart says, I am where I am only by the sheer and unmerited mercy of God. I am completely equal with other people. A sensitive social conscience and a life poured out in deeds of mercy to the needy is the inevitable sign of a person who has grasped the doctrines of grace. The Lord, through James, beckons us in love to analyze ourselves. He declares that we are God's first fruits. We are his first fruits. We are his children, his heirs, and we are them because of his grace and because of his mercy. And as such, in our day-to-day -day living, those first fruits, the God working in us, must happen. God has to be able to work through us and work um, in us if our faith is alive. James is letting us and reminding them to, to know that. So as this quote says, those are the doctrines of grace. I have to ask myself, do I understand that which has been given to me? Do I understand grace? Do I understand the mercy and salvation that I have received? If so, then I care for and I am concerned for those less fortunate than me, than those that are hurting, that those for those that do not know Jesus yet. I am concerned for them. I am socially, I am sensitive with a social conscience. I understand what's going on around me. I am sensitive and desire to do what God would have me do, to be his hands and be his feet. James drives this point even deeper in chapter 2. Now, I love the Amplified Version of the Bible. I read the King James Version. The NIV is one that I will reference. Um, I also like a version that has a lot of Hebrew in it. I have to do a lot of digging. I read uh, Matthew Henry's commentary to get some background and understand scripture. Um, but I do enjoy the Amplified Bible. It has a lot more words in it, some um, uh, in-text descriptions and qualifying uh, words, but it lets you know. But I love how the Amplified Bible puts James chapter 2, verse 1. It says, My brethren, pay no servile regard to people. Show no prejudice. Show no partiality. Do not attempt to hold and practice the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Do not attempt to practice your faith together with snobbery. That really spoke to me. It did. Do not try to say you are a Christian and practicing the faith of God when you're holding on to snobbery at the same time. If there's prejudice, don't do it. If there's discrimination, don't do it. Don't judge people by their race, their gender, their creed, what they have, what they do not have, uh, their lineage, where they come from. Near I say, uh, might I say, if they have an up and down relationship with God or if their walk with God is a little stagnant, don't judge them. Those factors cannot matter when determining who shall enter the kingdom of God. Not from our part, because the scripture says that alone, God alone is the judge, right? And yet we err, we become idolaters when we choose to place ourselves, to see ourselves in the office of the judge. If he alone is judge, if God is judge, and I decide I am the judge, then I make myself to be God. How dare I say that? How could I do that? Now, you may be thinking, no, I don't do that. I would never. I would never. Now, hear me. Please hear me. This spoke to me, too. I remembered some instances over the past few weeks. James is very clear. He is super clear. He uses a um, great illustration that is very black and white. He says, when a rich man comes into you, he comes to the kingdom. He wants to be a part of the kingdom. And he comes to you, he has rings, gold rings on his fingers. He is well-dressed. And he comes to you, he has the lineage. He has all the parts. And you say to him, please enter into the kingdom of God. Sit here at my right hand. Be close to me. Be in my ministry. Do these things with me. Be my friend. 
And yet when a poor man comes in, one who may not have the lineage, or one that doesn't have the rings, he doesn't have the wealth, he doesn't have what we think are the skills, or he's dressed shabbily, and he comes in, he doesn't seem to have much to offer. When he comes in, now we are good Christians, so we say, yes, welcome to the kingdom of God. Come on in. But, oh, don't sit here. Sit, maybe you should sit over there. Maybe you should sit over there. That's a good place for you. Or James even mentions, we say, sit at my feet. We do err. We do err if we do that. And like I said, you may think, I would never do that. And yet we do. That young man who sits on the pew in the youth service and he looks at the ceiling or down at his feet or he's fiddling with his fingers and he doesn't seem to be paying any attention. I have seen young men like that also witness to their friends at school and bring visitors and, and, and bring Jesus into their lives. Or what about that saint of God that is, they're not extro extroverted, they're introverted. To go down and be exuberant in the altar and to wave their hands and shout and worship, it is terrifying to them in some ways. They, they don't like to be touched by a lot of other people. And so we think, well, okay, we, we just don't even think of them maybe. Oh, they come all the time, they're faithful, that's great, but it is that saint of God who has a prayer closet in their home, who goes into their home, who God sees in secret as they cry out your name and my name every day. They are taking the kingdom of God by force, and yet we do not even see them, because we do not, we don't see that part of them, but we have this expectation of what progress should look like. What about that person who's been coming to church a couple of years now, and maybe they're not making the progress that we, judging, think they should make? And so we go, well, yeah, they come. We don't see their heart and their soul. We don't see their past. We don't see the hurt that they have to come through. But a patient and gracious God sees them, and such were some of us. He sees them and he is patient and he takes them step by step by step in the revelation of who he is. And he takes those burdens from them. And when they are ready to release them in love and in care, and he doesn't give up because they haven't met the timeline that we think they should make. And they have gone on to be pastors and wonderful evangelists and men and women of God serving faithfully in their church and witnessing to others who are growing through the same pain. We cannot show discrimination, nor can we show preference, is what James is saying, because we do not know. We do not know. Only the judge knows. Our job as Christians is to reach out to all men, to recognize we are all equal. We all have the same potential in Christ, because it is none of us. He equips the called, remember? He equips the call. It has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with him. And so you may say, I would never tell someone, I would never say, sit at my feet. And yet we do show preference, and we do show partiality. We're shocked when Brother So-and-so or Sister show and show shows a talent we never even knew they had because we never gave them a chance. We must see ourselves. We must go to the mirror and see ourselves clearly. We must come to the Lord and say, show me my heart. Help me understand my thoughts. What is it, God? Is there any evil thing inside of me? Help me to be more like you. James is saying, don't you dare say you're a Christian with one breath and then dismiss a soul out of the next because of your snobbery. Don't do it. We are, we are comfortable around people more like us. But I've been challenged by pastors before, and I encourage you, find people that are not like you, that don't think like you. Find them and learn, because they too have been made in the image of God. It will open your understanding of yourself, and it will open your understanding of others, that you may love more purely and more as the gospel teaches. A quote our uh, author says that I wanted to bring to you because it was a very aha moment for me. He says, this very behavior, it is this behavior that soils the name of Christ, that tarnishes the witness of the church, and that tears down the gladness of heart of those present among us. 
it tarnishes the witness of the church and it soils the name of Christ because we are not acting like him. Our faith is not alive in us. We have a knowledge, a conversion experience, but we are not allowing him to do the work in us to make us more like him, to take on his mind, his heart, his culture, and not our own. We are not submitting. James goes right to the root of the problem. Submission through love, a love bond servant to Christ. He said in verse 1 of chapter 1, I, James, the servant of Jesus Christ. He recognizes the importance of that, and it's not over through force, but it is a love bond that he has with Christ Jesus that we also need if we are to be effective witnesses and to allow our faith to grow. We must never forget the grace that has saved us. There's one more point that I would like to make in this Bible study. Now, I'll admit, this is the point that I was challenged about when the Lord uh, was speaking to me. I have been studying this chapter. I've been studying the material we were given for the Bible study. The Lord kept bringing me back to this point, and he has confirmed it through different ministers and through the sermons that we have heard lately and reading the Bible. So I'm very excited about it, and I'm very convicted about it. I am both, but remember, he convicts and chastens those that he loves. The third point I'd like to bring is that many of us are sitting in the seat of the judge, and the person that we are judging is ourselves. We judge ourselves. Now, I'm not saying if God has brought that mirror to your face and said we need to work on these things that we don't. That, please understand me, that is not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that we look at ourselves and say, no, not you. You're not good enough. You're too old. You're too young. You don't have the background. You don't have enough knowledge. Um, who are you? Who would you think? Leave the preaching to the pastors. Leave, leave the Bible studies to the teachers. Um, I can't be a worship leader in my house. I mean, whatever it is that you have in that blank, that you hear when God calls you out of the norm, when God calls you out of your comfort zone, that is the judgment that you are passing over yourselves. And we do not well. This convicts me and it encourages me. Remember, God chastens those who he loves. We are all called to do more than what we are doing. We are all called. Malachi says, hath not God created us? Do we not all have one father? Do we not all have the same father and has he not called us? Is it not the same spirit of God that filled the, the elders of the church, the pastors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, Simon, Peter? Is it not the same spirit of God, the same Holy Ghost that fills them, that fills us? Have we not received the same from them? Do we not all have the same conversion, the same understanding of Jesus Christ and who he is and the power thereof? Do we not understand that? Did Jesus not shed the same blood, every drop of blood for you and for me? Has he not called us? Has he not redeemed us? If we believe these things, then we cannot pass that judgment on ourselves. We cannot. But we must believe that he that hath called us will equip us. That's scripture. We have to believe that he that desires to do a good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. And he desires that you continue to grow and do a work for him. And he will equip you. Luke and Matthew both said, do not take worry. Don't, don't take heart. Don't worry about the things that you will say when you are called upon by the elders or people in authority or even your neighbor. Don't worry about it, but stay in the word. Prepare yourself. Timothy says, be prepared and ready because the Spirit of God will give you the words to speak. Joseph, we mentioned him earlier. He was the youngest of all the brothers. According to culture, he should not have risen up. He would have been the last. King David was the same way. And yet God has a way of calling those we do not think fit the norm. Joseph was called. He came in, he had dreams, he had to learn which dreams were for him, which dreams were to speak out to others. Then he is falsely accused by Pharaoh's wife. He's thrown into prison, but instead of wallowing for himself, he continues to let the faith that he has in Jehovah grow in him and make him more like him. He continues to receive dreams from the Lord. God opens a door for him, and he is elevated to the second in command, second only to Pharaoh 
when the famine comes. And when his brothers come to him seeking grain that they would not starve to death, he had the power to exercise revenge. But because he allowed God to show him in a mirror who he was, and because he allowed God to do a work in him, he is responsible for saving not one, but two kingdoms, Egypt and Israel. And he restores his family. He restores his family. Esther. Esther is another beautiful example. The only qualification she needed to come and be the queen was that she was female, born at that time, while the king was seeking one. She was chosen by him, but she was a single, pure maiden. That's it. None of those things she could control. But the qualification that God had for her is that she was a child of God who heard the calling on her life and who chose, who chose to submit herself to the Lord, who chose to obey what he had asked her to do. That's all that was required of her. And she too saves her people from extinction. She too. The children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they only had to choose to continue to believe in the Lord through the fire, and they're responsible for the conversion of a kingdom. Daniel and the lion's den, there are so many examples, so many examples, and someone could have said, you're just not good enough. Who are you? Who do you think you are? I'll tell you who we think we are. We're called and we're filled. We make that faith, we take that faith and keep it alive, and then we open ourselves and say, Lord, who would you have me speak to today? Lord, what would you have me do today? That's all that is required. That is all that is required of you. You're thinking, I'm stuck in my house. What can I possibly do? I can't go out and be a witness. Who am I going to be a witness to? I want to let you know there are tons of people all over the world who need your prayers. The scripture says, if my people will humble themselves and pray, then will I hear from heaven and I will hear their way. We cannot do God's job, and he won't do ours. But if we, if we embrace the grace that we have been given, if we embrace the calling that has been given in our lives, we humble ourselves and we pray. There are physicians and nurses now and over the next few weeks here in the South that are going to have to make a lot of tough decisions, that are going to see a lot, a lot of things that will affect them emotionally, will affect them psychologically and their spirit will become weak. There are people, grocery clerks, truckers, farmers that are putting in continual hours trying to keep our economy going and to provide for us. Those people need your prayers. There are pastors. There are pastors who need your prayers. How do I minister to a flock, to a church like James did? How do I minister to them while they are dispersed, while they are not in their norm? How do I speak? Lord, give me confidence. Give me courage to speak those things. Pray for your leaders of your city, your state, of our nation, of the world. These are different times, just like in the book of James. They are different times, but you can pray. You can intercede. Prayer does not require elegance. Prayer does not require you to be a perfect speaker. All it requires is that you do it and that you are sincere with it. I challenge you and I encourage you to find this time. Allow the Lord to see, to show you the mirror, to grow so that we are able. There is coming a time when our doors will open. There is coming a time when we will be able to walk out and be done with COVID uh, isolation because of all of the pathology of how it works. But there's coming a day and some of you are going to be walking out like John the Baptist with your big old bushy hair and your tattered clothes and being a little uncultured and people might look at you and go, who are you? But remember, John the Baptist is the one that God ordained, that God chose from the womb of his mother to declare, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. To declare, he, that is the one. Look at Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. He is the one who has come to save the world. You can walk out of your home ready and prepared to be that person. You can walk out and be that person. We are called to be that person, but we must have courage to look in the mirror to see what needs to be done. And we have to allow God to work within us and prepare us, and then we need to be willing to step out and answer the call that he has placed on our life. 
please, if God is dealing with you, if you feel something changing, there's some uncertainty, what do I do with this norm? If you are having fear in your heart, then pray for those who need prayer. Pray for them. It is something I do that the Lord has taught me when I start feeling down or I start feeling discouraged. I find someone who needs prayer even more than I, and I invest. I love them through my prayer closet. If God is dealing with you, please be sensitive. Be a hearer and a doer of the word. James speaks to them. He pastors to them. These Bible studies and our pastor will be pastoring us. Be open to that, but do not pass judgment on yourself. Allow the Lord to decide if you are qualified. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself, church, because we are walking out. We will be declaring who he is. That is his calling for our church. Be confident that he will be doing these things. Be confident. Please pray with me, Lord. We thank you. We thank you that we know that all men are created equal. And during this time, you have made us see it. You have brought it to the front, Lord. Give us ears to hear, I pray. Give us ears to hear your voice. Help us to recognize it, Lord. Let us submit our spirits to you, God, our wills to you, Lord, that we can become the church that you have prophesied over us to be, that we can be comfortable with obeying, that it will become our norm, hearing your voice and obeying it, Lord, doing the things that you have called us to do. Give us wisdom, I pray, our leaders and each of us, wisdom beyond our understanding, Lord, an understanding of the times, wisdom beyond our experience, Experience, Lord, an understanding of what you are calling us to do, creating us clean hearts, oh God, I pray. Help us, Lord, to willingly take on right spirits, because your word says, then shall we teach transgressors your ways. Then shall sinners be converted unto you, God. We are your first fruits, James says. We are your children, Lord, Matthew says. We are yours. And I pray, oh God, that you would help us to see ourselves as you see us. To see others, Lord, as you see them. And to choose, Lord, to allow you to do the work that our faith would be alive and would grow and would put forth fruits. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this lesson. We ask that you would have your way and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for listening to us, for seeing this video. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. We thank him for that. We ask that you would be with us this week. Please go with God. Be open to the mirror. Hear his word. We love you. Thank you.